there's a difference between leading and collaborating and delegation. And I was not delegating to students. I was helping them lead. And I felt like it was just part of their education to become the kinds of leaders that they wanted to, wanted to be and deserve to be. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni. Today we're joined by Don Miller. He's the former band director at Adams State's music program. He talks quite a bit about his experiences there leading the uh, band program and also some feedback that he got that he felt kind of micromanaged his efforts there by giving students additional responsibilities and leadership roles that his department chair discouraged. He also commented on the online graduate program in music and his thoughts about what the program did or did not do with regard to preparing students, the kind of coursework that he thought was woefully inadequate, he said, for the kind of coursework that was being taught online. Don reflects on what he considered to be a revolving door of band directors who come through Adam State over the years, many with the intention of staying longer, but for one reason or another, just don't stick around. Finally, he comments on a number of issues relating to lowered enrollment rates, the academic sanction of Adam State by the Higher Learning Commission, and consistently low faculty pay that may create conditions that are difficult for Adam State to succeed in a long-term basis. All this and more on this edition of the Watching Adams podcast. Uh, Don Miller, and I uh, was at Adams State from 2013 to 2015. They've had some real problems keeping a uh, band director there, and I was hired in the towards the end of June of 2015 uh, because I was uh, uh, definitely looking for another job because my previous position was uh, not working out and it was rather difficult for me to continue. Uh, plus, I had family situation. My mother-in-law was very sick in western Kansas, and we knew that her time was going to be short, so we wanted to be at a place where we could get there in just a couple of hours, as opposed to somewhere where it would take us um, a, a full day to get there in case we had to go uh, quickly. So at the time, were you intending to stay at Adam State University for longer than you ended up staying? Yes, I was. My plan was to build a band program there. I knew that it had been a challenge for many other uh, directors in the past, uh, one to two years was generally how long people stayed there. When I interviewed, there were some. It was very serious uh, as far as what they wanted to do with the band program. They wanted to develop it, um, become stronger than it was, uh, of course. And I had a had a way of doing that. I felt like I was quite honest uh, with them during the interview about who I was and how I was doing it. So you were saying there was some disagreement moving forward as you were starting to really take over the band direction program. Yes. Uh, one of the things that um, I started to do was really incorporate the students um, into some responsibilities for them, uh, including uh, drill design, including some um, drill design for the marching band, including uh, uh, working with the top of the nation honor band, which is uh, the largest recruiting project, uh, recruiting event. Actually, I guess is what I should say, recruiting event for uh, the music department. By incorporating the students in both of those, I felt I was really preparing them to be uh, teachers, teachers in music and band directors in the future. The students really enjoyed that and took that responsibility very seriously. And it was something that they enjoyed a whole lot, but I, I it, that wasn't necessarily the philosophy of what some of the administrators or uh, other people in the music department thought. So uh, that was just a level of responsibility that you were conferring upon students that uh, perhaps your department chair or others in the music department did not agree with? It was particularly the department chair. Um, she uh, kept calling it delegation and that I was uh, passing responsibilities on to students, but I believed it was leadership. And I was uh, taking full responsibility for anything that they did that was considering mistakes. And I was giving them responsibility for anything that I felt like was uh, successes. But she, she didn't view it that way at all. It was just um, there's a difference between leading and collaborating and delegation. And I was not delegating to students. I was helping them lead. And I felt like it was just part of their education to become the kinds of leaders that they wanted to, wanted to be and deserved to be. Yeah, I think I can relate in the sense that there's a fine line, perhaps, between delegating on to students certain responsibilities, but also taking a leadership role in how you oversee the, the projects or activities that students run 
but you had a pretty clear idea about what you wanted to do. You feel like you made that clear from the outset and your department chair didn't support you in that. Is that correct? Oh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. She, uh, when it first started becoming a, a noticeable problem was when uh, we were preparing for the Top of the Nation band and the day before, uh, actually the afternoon before the students were arriving, she called me into her office and was really expressing concern about the organization of it. And I just said, it's 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 going to be fine. I can't remember exactly what I said. And then the next day when everything was running smoothly, she even said to me, you know, it's going really, really well. And I said, thank you. I knew it would. I And I appreciate that. Uh, and it did. It went very smoothly. And the next year when we did it again, well, by that time, I'd already resigned. So I was pretty much doing it my way. She was also on sabbatical that semester, uh, and it went um, again quite successfully. As a matter of fact, one of the letters of recommendation that I got from one of the faculty members expressed that about how organized it was, and talking to the uh, high school directors that brought students in, they seemed to agree with that. I felt like I was having good success with it, particularly since the numbers of students that were coming in was very high. So I'm going to step back just a bit. We really got right into it here, and I wanted to kind of get a broader sense of what's going on. So you taught at Adams State for two years. You accepted the position of band director. That position historically has had a lot of turnover. Could you give us an estimate as to maybe how many band directors had come through that program in any number of recent years? Well, see, I really started paying attention to college positions when I was um, a graduate student at Iowa starting there in 1995. Um, and then, let's well, see, you know, 1999, I noticed the position was open and I got a phone call from the, the uh, then department chair, Charles Boyer. So in my thought of the last 20 years or so, I would say there's probably been eight to 10 band directors that have come through. So I understand that you had been aware of Adam State's music program for some time, and you had noticed that the band director position kept becoming open over the years. Was that a red flag for you, or were you a little bit concerned before you applied that the turnover seemed unusually high for this position? I did kind of think that, that it was unusually high. and I, I, So I went in not necessarily with skepticism, but I went in with, with open uh, eyes and was, was wondering what was taking place there. So, yeah, I didn't know about it, but I thought what was missing was just consistency and building up the program. So that's what I was ready to dedicate myself to. So when you uh, arrived at Adam State, you had every intention of staying longer than you did. Is that correct? Correct. That is, yes, that is correct. So you've mentioned earlier an issue over how much responsibility students had uh, as part of the, uh, this is the marching band? The marching band, I, uh, one of the things that um, I realized very quickly when I got there is the marching band was something where there was uh, one drill design that was used for the entire year or the entire season. And uh, sometimes it was even called a show band where they just went out on, on the field and turned around and played. And I didn't think that was going to be a very good experience for the future teachers. So I had one of the students that first year that so had quite a bit of experience, and he did drill design for all of the, uh, all the marching band shows, and it seemed to work out really well. Would it be fair to say that even though your department chair didn't really agree with the way that you were running this, the students themselves were having a positive experience and that they were getting something out of it? Yes, absolutely. The evaluations for the courses were good. Uh, even the evaluations for the department chair for what she saw when I was doing concert band or wind ensemble, uh, those um, those evaluations were very good as well. So then overall, and we'll we'll get more to the circumstances of your departure, but during this time, you were getting strong student evaluations, strong department evaluations. Were there any indications that your performance wasn't satisfactory or there were areas where you weren't meeting your job requirements? Well, the, the first semester, uh, I was taken aback a little bit by a uh, mar the marching band techniques class. At that point, I didn't do marching band in fall, I guess, for, uh, um, I guess, seven, eight years. Um, I w went in kind of hanging on, uh, learning, organizing what I could. Uh, after a while, it just became that I was out of information to give them, so I asked them to do independent work for their build designs tonight. But I, I guess that was something that the, the provost then was not happy with because he wanted a lot of contact hours during that time. So during my, um, my I guess, my first semester retention meeting, that was brought up and I expressed, you know, that, okay, I understand where that came from. And it just basically what I said was just be patient with me. I 
guess that was the first indication. And then the other one was the uh, situation with the, uh, the the honor band for Top of the Nation. The third indication was the department chair didn't like the way I was organizing the graduate course that I was going to teach. And that was a real challenge because it was an online course for something that was going to be necessary for the grad students to hear the differences. I, w- I just spent a lot of time trying to figure out how that was going to work. And being a person that was kind of in between the technology time, I didn't do very well with the technology. I was getting it. I was doing okay with it. And that's then right after that discussion in May, uh, my mother-in-law died. So it was a situation of, okay, let's, let's get somebody else through the class. And then I made it clear afterwards that I had no interest in online graduate courses after that. All right, so just trying to unpack this here, your mother died in May of, what would that have been, 2014? Yes, my mother-in-law died in May May of 2014. Okay, so when your mother-in-law died, you had like some family leave issues or you needed to spend some time away? I needed to spend some 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 time away. She had, was uh, being put on hospice at that time, and that was kind of an excuse for both of us because I sure didn't want to do the class. I had misunderstood or didn't ask the right questions about the course. I didn't know the course was going to go going to go from May to August. I assumed it was a typical summer course where it was going to be June through the end of July, but we didn't know. That wasn't clear. And this um, was an online graduate course. What was the title of the class? It was an uh, orchestration or instrumentation where we had students were to make arrangements of like a brass quintet or brass ensemble, or string quartet, those kinds of things. And they were to, the whole point of, the, of it is to learn the ranges of the instruments, to learn how the instruments interact with each other. And that was going to be, according to me, just incredibly difficult to do because the students were not going to be able to hear the differences in, in the arrangements I was asking them to do. I still don't think that's a, uh, a good way to do that. As a matter of fact, I think the resources available to Adam State for a course like that uh, or a degree like that uh, is woefully inadequate. After a little while of doing that and realizing uh, how so many other faculty that were doing that were quite unorganized and not, not returning papers on time, those kinds of things, but I just really got the sense that it really wasn't that much of a degree program. It was more like a fundraiser for the department. That's where the money was coming in as tuition money. There's a lot there that I want to explore in a second, but just to get a baseline, you were teaching a full-time capacity tenure-track position, is that correct? That's correct. And so you, you intended to stay through the evaluation period of three to five years so that you could be awarded tenure? Yes, I was. It's interesting, though, that you didn't end up going all the way to your tenure review, that uh, your time at Adams State was much shorter than that. It was. Did you know at the time you started teaching at Adams State that online graduate coursework would be a part of your teaching load? Well, that was actually going to be something extra. Um, And I was asked very early, like in September, uh, my first year there, if I would be interested in doing that. And I said, of course, yeah, I'd be interested for two reasons. One of them, I thought I would enjoy that process. And the other is the pay was so low that I feel like I wanted to to, to raise that, you know, a general consensus across the department. Uh, What were you making at Adams State? Uh, I'm trying to remember now. I think I was making... $45,000 Forty forty five thousand the first year. The second year when I was kinda of called called on the carpet for not actually doing drill design and incorporating the students on it, uh, I took a pay cut. I took a pay cut of a thousand dollars for that. Uh that didn't necessarily make me bitter, but that made me think this is going a direction that I don't like. So the pay was lower than you might have liked. So as a way to supplement that, you started teaching this online graduate course? I started preparing for it. Uh, I didn't I didn't teach it when it was determined that I wasn't going to teach it. I was uh, given $1,000 for all the preparation that I had done. And so I accepted that, and that was just fine. Just to clarify, this came up in a recent interview. That $1,000 that you were paid in course preparation, is it your understanding that um, in exchange for that pay, the university would would own the syllabus or other course materials that you prepared for that class? There were several things that were kind of uh, mushy during that time. I was told that I was going to get paid $3,000 for the course. As I prepared the syllabus for it, uh, it would become university property, and I would get $4,000 for that. You know, I thought, okay, that, that would be fine. 
But again, it was something where I thought that I was just going to be teaching from the 1st of June until the end of July after I'd really committed to it that it was going to start right after graduation and it was going to go right up until the middle of August. So that was quite the surprise. Well, I'm glad yeah, that I, you I, said that, Don, because uh, when I spoke with the co-president of the Colorado chapter of American University Professors, Jonathan Reese, I mentioned to Jonathan that Adam State has a policy of owning course materials by paying professors to develop a course that then they sort of have proprietary ownership of. And he found that really disturbing because he said that it sort of de-skills the profession of, uh, of teaching and it basically turns higher education into kind of a program whereby the university can just standardize and uh, automatize so that in the future we don't need someone like Don Miller who has expertise, mm-hmm. right? We can just get some guy like Danny Ladoni who knows very little about music to administer the course. Well, and the, the other thing is also is if I were to go somewhere else and teach the same course, the syllabus is, and the preparation for it is virtually the same. And it's actually uh, it's quite universal uh, across the country. There's really, you know, when, in that course, the, the deviation between colleges and universities is probably a very little. I think 80 percent of the courses work that is necessary for a class like that is standard. You really can't change it to anything else. So I'm not sure how the, that copyright, so to speak, would have, would have worked. It would be interesting if, if Adam State were to go after you later for, you know, essentially violating uh, their copyright or their intellectual property of, of your class that you developed while you were there that you're now teaching elsewhere. Yeah, they. I don't think they would have a leg to stand on because there'd be so many examples of other schools that they would have to go after for that course. So in addition to the ownership issue that we just discussed, you were saying earlier that the uh, the resources that Adam State had to teach a class like this online were woefully inadequate. You said that it didn't provide the kind of materials or preparation that would really give the student the experience they needed. Is that correct? That is correct. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing, the most or virtually all of the materials actually were coming from online sources. And, you know, they were sources from other universities that I was finding that worked uh, for, for the class. That's another reason why I started thinking, okay, this is more of a fundraiser. And then I spoke to a couple of other people that had been asked to be a part of that program as well as far as music faculty. And they declined also for that very reason, that there just simply wasn't enough resources there. It's not a graduate school, um, you know. It's, it's a school to, to uh, uh, develop teachers, and I'm not sure why it was decided that a master's degree program, particularly online, for something that is you know based in, in sound and hearing, uh, was going to work. Well, I think you probably said it earlier when you said it was a fundraising program. Boy, it sounds overall from what you'd said earlier that you were almost being micromanaged, that you had a certain vision for how you were running uh, the band program, uh, and even though you were getting strong evaluations from your students, your department chair was really pushing back on the design of ostensibly what you were hired with your expertise to do. One of the things that I got the sense that they were concerned about is that students would uh, be challenged too much and they would leave. One of the largest things that was happening in the department was I felt like a lot of the students that were there were not being treated as as if they were students there. They were being treated as recruitment vehicles for other students coming in. So overall, would you say that there were some issues with the academic rigor of the coursework in the music department or grade inflation or any other issues that might be the hallmark of a program more designed to recruit uh, and retain students as opposed to challenge them and develop their skills? I do think that there would be some people that would have expectations of not necessarily being lower, but have expectations of, okay, let's help this person get through the course and the, or through the course or through the program, as opposed to, okay, let's, let's really challenge this person because of personality issues or, or somewhat. Um, you know, I had a student that um, it was obvious this student, to me, it was obvious this, this student was well beyond what we could offer. The reason I believe that particular student didn't go somewhere else is uh, because of insecurity in high school days. And it became pretty evident quickly that that person was talented enough and beyond what uh, the school could offer. Can you tell me then about the circumstances of your leaving Adam State? Was it a mutual decision? Did you resign? Were you terminated? 
Well, it was interesting. Uh, what, what was taking place uh, during that time, uh, it was a zero to five vote on the, for the committee to put forward retention of me. Uh, one of the questions that was asked during that, that meeting, I know it's supposed to be confidential, but one of the questions that was asked is, this is a good fit for you? And my answer to that was, I'm I don't know. I really don't know the answer to, to that. And the more I thought thought about that, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that a little bit more. And then when the question came up, that was my response. And then, you know, within an hour or so later, I said, no, if they're having those kinds of issues with the way I do things, then I'm definitely not a good fit. I resigned before the decision went on up through the administration. And it's interesting, as soon as I resigned, I just felt so much better about my, my future and, and myself. Uh, I was sleeping better. I was, I was moving forward. And I knew it would be good, whatever was going to take place. So once you resigned from Adam State, you acquired a greater sense of peace of mind. You were sleeping better. Uh, did you have a sense at that point what your future job prospects would be? I had no idea, but I, I was applying for similar positions uh, in uh, academia, uh, and I got some s- some very serious interest. Had some in- some interviews, uh, but since it's so competitive, you know, it, it just didn't work out at that time. So I, I did get a job here in Enid, um, Oklahoma, where I'm teaching orchestra. You know, I'm it, it's working out very well. So we'll see. We'll see what happens, and I'm I'm enjoying it much more because I have so much more autonomy. I feel like I can just uh, trusted more, not only respected more, but trusted more. So you took a position as a high school band director, essentially? Uh, or- orchestra director. Or- I'm teaching strings. I'm, uh, I'm enjoying that very much. For, and for the primary reason is, in Oklahoma especially, during uh, football season, every single Friday night, and I do mean every Friday night, not only are they playing, for the home, playing and performing for the home game, but they travel to wherever the away game is. Uh, it's, it's been working out very well. So looking back in retrospect, now that you have gone through the revolving door of Adam State's band director position, what would it take for that department to retain its faculty more uh, so that in the future we have a band director at Adam State who stays there longer and who ostensibly can help build that retention with students? Uh, what they need to do is hire... Uh, a higher person that, well, actually it's not a person. What they need to do with this person is give them autonomy and trust. I was contacted by a, a student that was really wanting to do something in particular with the new director that came in uh, there, and that person said, well, let me check with the department. <laughs> then the department said, no, you, you're not going to do that. Um, and so, you know, I find that to be absurd because I would have actually never even gone to the department. I would just would have made the decision myself whether I wanted to do that. Well, that's why you're uh, not I, there, Don, because you uh, yeah. take that kind of initiative. Yeah, I didn't feel like I, 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 I don't know, I wasn't part of the clique. I wasn't part of, um, clique may be a strong word. I just wasn't part of the culture that was there. I think that's a better word. I just wasn't part of the culture and, and what had already been established. And I was perfectly willing to uh, uh, do what I felt like needed to be done. And, you know, it wasn't understood, appreciated. I'm not sure what it was. So looking back, would you have done anything differently? Or was that the course that things just ran based on who you are and based on how that department is configured? I, I think that's the best way to put it. I, I am who I am. I am bad I am. And I did not, it, it, part of the things that began to happen when I realized it wasn't going to work out, I thought, I, okay, I could battle for this job. But I just kept feeling worse and worse about that because it, it was going to be a situation where they were wanting to, and I would have had to change my entire approach that I've developed for the last 20 years. And the last 20 years, I've had enormous success with students and mentoring students and developing students as strong leaders uh, and confident leaders as well. Would I do things differently? I, I can't, and I don't think I would have. One of the things that I do find really unique, I guess, to Adam State is the annual retention meetings uh, with 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 everybody. I you know it's I think standard is okay. There's a third year review, and then there's a you know then there's the ten year vote. But you're left alone to develop your own way for the first two and a half three years. You know, I don't understand the function of the retention meetings unless there's a plan to make sure that everybody fits into their own way. That certainly does fit into a model where faculty are being micromanaged or they are having, you know, their their every decision scrutinized with more of these kinds of meetings and reviews. You know, and, and as I was talking to the students that are at Adam State, some one of the things I was beginning to realize is the scholarship situation is 
was, at that time anyway, very, very poor. So there was a lot of reliance on uh, student loans because there were a lot of students who just were being attracted that didn't have the financial means. And there were some students that were going to graduate with forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000 of student debt and go teach in you know, a little bitty town in Colorado or just get a music performance degree from Adams State, which has not something that's, that's why it's to do even at, at the, some of the strongest universities in, in, the, in the United States because it's just it's so challenging. So they were going to graduate, but like I said, forty five, fifty thousand dollars in debt, each in a small school, and be saddled with loan payments probably for the rest of their life. So in other words, the economics of what the student would take out in terms of loans wasn't necessarily a good return on investment for the kind of career they were getting into, and there were so few opportunities for scholarships to offset the tuition costs that the students were incurring? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's exactly right. I interviewed a student or two uh, for this podcast series that talked about how student athletes have some opportunity for athletic scholarships, but if you're a non-athlete student, then it's very difficult to piece together your education other than, you know, substantial loans. Right, yeah, and the... Uh with the experiences that take place within the music department uh, because of the size of the ensembles uh, like the band uh, and the orchestra and you know other things that are available to them you know there's not even a, a jazz band is a typically a 15 to 20 piece group and uh, you know they aren't even able to recruit a full jazz band so those kinds of experiences that they were having were in my view just simply were not adequate for a full musical experience so let me ask then recently Adam State University was sanctioned by the Higher Learning Commission uh, they've been placed on a two-year academic probation due to a number of compliance issues the HLC found with their extended studies online coursework mm -hmm. I don't know how aware of that you are but based on what you said earlier does it surprise you that Adam State has come under scrutiny for its online program? I heard about that before I left. Uh, the, I didn't hear about the uh, uh, probation, but I heard that there was an investigation, and it was, I guess it was the Chronicle of Higher Education that was reporting the story, and that you know, a highly reputable news organization, so I knew that something was going on. It became pretty evident pretty quickly to me within the first year or so that school very well may get the stuff in financial position uh, where it can no, no longer work. And I'm not sure if the state of Colorado, especially in the climate that's happening all over the country now, would rescue the school. Uh, so that was something. And yes, I did hear about that, actually, and one of the students, uh, former students, told me about it. Um, so I just did a search, and I found the uh, uh, the news story on uh, uh, Denver News Station and, and watched it, and it was a very good story. And I was just flabbergasted at how the uh, current president was responding. She said that there were, I guess you probably have seen it, she said that there were many things they've addressed, but then she went on to say, you know, really, is this something that they, they should allow for uh, an academic probation for an entire institution? And in my view, you know, if you're immediately making accusations and making excuses, that's not a good thing. You know, without, with a, an accreditation organization, you really have to just roll over and do what they say especially one that has so much experience with so many universities around the country. Yeah, certainly many people found the tack that President McClure took to be somewhat stunning, that she uh, publicly questioned the integrity of her accreditor. She characterized their treatment of Adam State as being unfair, that they were being targeted for a political statement. She said that she believed they were the, uh, the whipping boy of the Higher Learning Commission. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I find that to be absurd. I cannot imagine a, a commission being that political, and I also cannot imagine viewing the history of Adam State and uh, the financial position that it's in and the things we're trying to do to, to raise funds, uh, such as the online courses uh, that have so many athletes uh, and other students in California uh, submitting money. I, you know, I just think those kinds of things are fundraisers, and I, you know, I, it, I understand that. It was the community college in California that said this does not meet our standards. You cannot take these courses anymore. Uh, and that is it's not only embarrassing for the institution, I just think that that's incredibly unethical. Uh, any last thoughts you have, Don, uh, reflecting on your time at Adams State, or maybe advice that you would have for uh, other faculty in the music department or elsewhere uh, who are at Adams State now listening to this podcast? 
I realize that the climate now is that a lot of schools, even uh, public education, publicly supported or publicly, what do you call it now, publicly uh, state supported and then there's state assisted and then pretty soon I think there's just going to be state located. So I can understand where they're, where they're coming from, but um, it should tell a lot that, first of all, the, the president said that, what she said, and then the other thing is enrollment is not increasing and that's in this a state where the uh, population is increasing steadily, so that's very difficult to understand. And also, uh, it's evident through looking at the chronicle of our higher education that the pay there has been exceptionally low, uh, and I don't see that changing a whole lot because of their financial situation. And I also see the enrollment going down. You know, how can you recruit a student whenever you say, hey, come to our school. Yes, we're on probation, but uh, it's not our fault. So it sounds like there's a whole number of factors that are creating this negative feedback loop or this downward spiral of, uh, you know, low pay, uh, low enrollment, academic probation, uh, those issues. I feel fortunate that I left before they got on uh, academic probation because that could be a death knell for many, you know, many people that are looking for other positions because they look and say, oh, okay, <laughs> this school's on academic probation and it's competitive enough that there's a reason to put people in the let's look at them pile and then, okay, let's not look at this person pile. So in other words, the fact that Adam State is on academic probation might make it more difficult for someone teaching at Adam State to apply for and be hired at another institution? Possibly. I guess the individual, you know, there is, of course, would be a sec- exception, but I guess it depends on what the individual has been able to do concerning research, uh, concerning uh, so many other things. But it, um, it, it could be, it very well could be. I'm not sure if I would have taken that risk. When I first got there, one of the things that was happening was some questioning whether the department should be a member of the National Association of Schools of Music, uh, which is a you know, it's called NASM. And it's, some people think it's a big deal. I think it's a, it's not as nearly as big a deal as you as as people think it is. But one of the things the department chair wanted to make sure was it was important for them to be a member of that accrediting institution. So there was a bit of a battle, and finally it came to that they were going to remain in NASM, and the administration was going to pay for it. The argument had to do with if we have students graduate from this kind of accredited school, it's just going to be so much more important for their success as as teachers, and that's a very sensible argument. But um, when a person retired uh, in the music department, the person that they actually hired came from a school that was having difficulty just being accredited because of its history. She got her master's degree there at that same school and then got her doctorate at a school that was NASM accredited. But, you know, my logic of that is, okay, if this is such important to be a part of an NASM school for your bachelor's degree, why did you hire somebody that has the degree from a non-accredited school? Uh, You know, that was just paradoxical to me. I couldn't quite figure that out. So it's a question of how much priority and how much uh, consideration those kinds of accreditations have if you say that they're important, but then your practices include hiring people who didn't get their degree from schools that were accredited. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. And I I seriously doubt if very many people applied for that position. I do know that whenever I accepted the position, the, there was an advertisement in the fall for the uh, band director position. Uh, and then they re-announced the position in the spring. And it, it was actually told it to me, I think it was by the department chair, that they were just flabbergasted at how few applications they had the first round. Now, I can see that now. I can understand why that happened now because, you know, it doesn't have a good reputation uh, among band directors. It has a very, uh, very revolving door reputation. I was hoping to change that, but um, it didn't work out. Well, maybe every band director has to put in a year or two at Adam State, like a tour of duty in Iraq, you know, before they go on with their career. Yeah, we call that paying dues. Yep, paying your dues. Well, Don, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate having you on the podcast, and I'm happy to hear that you're doing well and doing something you really enjoy uh, in Oklahoma. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm having a, a, a great time, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good life, that's for sure. 